imagine 2018, I've got quite a lot of uh, money to invest. I've got quite a lot of uh, willpower and uh, knowledge, but I cannot be working with CBDs. So that's how I got into fiber. The yarn that we're producing right now, the woven fabrics that we're producing right now, are made thanks to a non-complete clause that was meant to destroy me and it actually made me stronger. That's Maciej Kowalski from Kombinat Konopny, and this is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and I am excited to share this episode with you today. I had a great conversation with Maciej Kowalski earlier in the week. I learned all about hemp in Poland and how he got the business started, and I was blown away by some of the stories he told me, so um, I'm really uh, hopeful that you will find this as informative and entertaining as I did. All right, so we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and then we'll be right back, and we'll get into my conversation with Maciej Kowalski. This episode is brought to you in part by IND Hemp in Fort Benton, Montana, where they believe in the goodness of hemp. IND Hemp is a family owned, mission driven, and environmentally focused industrial hemp food, feed, and fiber company, providing new opportunities for farmers and rural communities. Their mission is to provide innovative agricultural products and services to connect American farmers with the pioneers and businesses that see hemp as a way to bring real and lasting change to our communities and planet. Learn more at indhemp.com. This episode is brought to you in part by the National Hemp Association. The NHA is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that advocates for sensible public policy and regulation. The NHA is dedicated to building a sustainable future and promoting economic development in rural communities. Become a member today and join a thriving community of people with a passion for all things hemp. Learn more at nationalhempassociation.org. This episode is brought to you in part by King's Agri-Seeds, where they believe in the power of soil health. For over 25 years, King's Agri-Seeds has focused on crop management systems to promote diversity in soil life. For over 10 years, they've been pioneering the use of diverse rotation-specific cover crops. And for five years now, they've been working with the leading hemp seed providers and growers. King's Agri-Seeds' knowledge, ability, and service can make a difference on your farm. Give them a call today at 717-687-6224 or go to kingsagriseeds.com to learn more. Okay, welcome back. So uh, under normal circumstances, we'd have like a news nugget here or a calendar item or an update of some kind, but I don't have that for you today. Sorry, but what I do have for you is this fantastic interview with Mache Kowalski. I first met Mache last year at the NOCO Hemp Expo in Colorado. I only spoke to him very briefly, so I was I was excited about this opportunity to talk to him for a long time and hear more of his stories. And he's got great stories. In fact, his origin story, like how he got into hemp in the first place, is probably the best hemp origin story I have ever heard. But I don't want to give too much away, so let's just get into my conversation with Maciej Kowalski from Kombinat Konopny. Maciej Kowalski from Kombinat Konopny. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? Doing fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, I, I am on a mission this year to learn more about the global hemp industry, the, the European hemp industry. And I know there's a lot that we can learn as, you know, as the American industry in our, you know, adolescence, we can learn from some, uh, some countries that have been doing this a little bit longer. So well, it probably goes both ways goes uh, in both directions because uh, we've been doing it for quite a while although we had several decades of actually not doing it so um, I'm also curious to, to learn the lessons of the American uh, colleagues uh, we've basically been on this uh, on this journey for approximately the same time because I started with industrial part of the hemp with the fiber part of hemp around 2018 which is basically the time that uh, the evolution started in, in the US. And the way I see it is like, even though we live in the same, in the same, on the same planet, we work with the same plant, 
the American industry is going in a completely different direction than the European industry, and probably both parts are doing something good and some mistakes. All right. So it's a cultural exchange. So we can learn learn from each other. Let, let's just hope that we learn the good things rather than copy the, the bad funny things. Right. So. <laughs> Amen to that. So Mache, I wonder if you could just first give us a brief introduction. Where where are you? What are you doing? Yeah, so basically I run, uh, I'm a CEO and a founder of, Com of Combinat Konopne, which is a vertically integrated hemp operator uh, working both in the uh, herbal and fiber division. Um, and with herbal, I mean dietary supplements made from the green parts of the plant, uh, where we have a very uh, no-nonsense approach towards the uh, extraction, uh, which means basically we are not doing extraction because nature does it best. Uh, so I, understand, I believe strongly in the fact that cannabinoids were in our diet for centuries. Mm. Uh, Poland has a very long history of actually consuming cannabinoids unwittingly. My grand, great-grandparents were not aware of the fact that if they are feeding um, the hemp flowers to, to their uh, cows and they're drinking the milk, that it will contain some minor uh, amounts of cannabinoids. So uh, the way we are doing it, is we just mix uh, hemp biomass with uh, olive oil and then press it mechanically and that's where all the cannabinoids go to the oil. Wow. No um, distillation, no extraction, no kind of messing with the natural uh, ratios of the cannabinoids. Whatever is in the plant goes into the oil. So that's the um, the general idea behind the, the herbal division of, of the company, which okay. is, um, goes somehow uh, contrary to what uh, the the industry is going into making uh, delta eight HHC whatever derivatives. I don't mess with nature. I just put it in a bottle. Um, and then the the technical division, which is um, working with the hemp stalk, because I've, I've been working with hemp flower for more than ten years now, and hemp stalk has always been a uh, an enemy. It it was a, something that wraps around all the the bits and pieces. So uh, like five, six years ago, I decided to try to um, somehow work with it, not against it. Uh, and I came up with this idea, well, not, not much of an idea to make textiles out of it. Uh, there's like thousands of people trying to do it and thinking about it. So it's not nothing really original about it. Uh, the difference is we actually did it. We actually started doing it. So we are uh, growing hemp, we are harvesting hemp, we are decorticating hemp, then we are refining the fiber, we spin it into yarn, and we actually make the products out of it. So it's wow. a full value chain, uh, which, is, which goes back to the lessons European versus American industry. We are not very specialized, because if you do every step of the way, you cannot physically be specialized in every step of it, but I have 100% control of the full value chain. So we basically... Wow. From from the seed to the to the product, that's amazing. Um, I want to get into hearing more about the you know more details about the business, but first let's learn a little bit more about hemp in general in in Poland. The, when you look at the statistics, it looks a little bit the same as in the US, which means a um, rise and fall. Uh, although it's it, it goes up and up and down for quite some time. Um, it used to be a major crop in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, we had around 30,000 hectares, which is like 70,000 acres, uh, in a country that is the size of the state of Montana, uh, although we have like 40 million people instead of 1 million people that lives in Montana. Um, but relatively to the area of the country, it used to be a major crop. Okay. Uh, obviously not uh, on the par with, uh, with wheat or rapeseed, but... It used to be something that people were familiar with. It used to grow almost in every corner of the country. <clears throat> and then came a United Nations Convention, and then came uh, the um, popularity of synthetic fibers. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, early 90s come the uh, fall of communism and the destruction of all the uh, state-owned companies. So it basically came to almost zero. Uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we had less than 100 hectares of hemp, which is like 200 acres, yeah. nothing. Only research plot, uh, research plots and, and, and some um, crazy people trying to revive it. I was among them. Uh, when I started growing hemp 11 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the total area was 150 hectares. 
The yeah. next year, I was growing 500 alone. Uh, so it started like a small boom. Obviously, uh, small because the the peak that was reached in 2019, it was 3,500 hectares, so around you know, 8,000 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, quite significant, especially to 150 that used to be. But then most of them were growing for flowers, right. for cannabinoids, uh, which, as we know, uh, crashed because there was like the the demand was uh, growing, but the supply was growing tenfold. The, 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 the requirement of the demand. Uh, and then um, in 2018, uh, on our local market, on our domestic market, there was a huge news, which I contributed to because I sold my previous company to a Canadian holding. And uh, obviously I wasn't paid this, the same amount that was in the news release, but the news release contained a lot of zeros, like a huge number. So uh, how people, people read it? All right, there's easy money in hand. Obviously, as we know, if there is no such thing as easy money, and uh, if even if there is some money in it, if a hundred people want to share this amount of money, it no longer is a lot of money. Uh, so that that what contributed to a uh, to the peak of of uh, growers thinking that if you can make this and that amount of money from one hectare of growing it for flowers, well, let's do a thousand. Right. And you're going to make right. a thousand. Oh, right. Well, they, it doesn't work that way. They went into it with dollar signs in their eyes. Right? Yeah, yeah, precisely. So the same story as in the US. Uh, it leveled off at around 2,000 hectares this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's no longer falling. It's not growing yet. But um, we see that the, the CBD uh, growers are no longer doing it. Uh, even in my, my case, I still grow for fiber, but we moved our uh, cannabinoid plantations to Italy because basically our climate, when you compare it to, to the map of North America, I'm someplace in Edmonton. Uh, it, it doesn't even fit any place in the US. Okay. Um, so uh, growing it in Italy allows uh, the cannabinoids to, uh, to reach higher concentration. We even did a test plot of growing exactly the same variety, an Italiana, Growing it in uh, northern Poland and uh, uh, central Italy, they had eight percent cannabinoids. I had two percent cannabinoids. Oh, doing wow. everything else the same, so there is simply no point in doing it, right? Okay. Uh, but then going back to the, the Polish market, um, it used to be a huge market in the sixties, in the seventies. Well, not necessarily market, the industry rather. Okay. Uh, we were uh, the communist. Com right. It was all state run. It was so, all yeah. Okay. Yeah, and basically they were all losing money. But they had a plan to realize so well the plan is above everything else. And they were mostly supplying a Soviet army with fiber. Okay. So the moment Soviet army no longer required uh, hemp fiber because there was no longer a hemp, uh, the Soviet army. Yeah. Well, hemp army, maybe, maybe it should uh, be <laughs> come to life. Uh, anyways, uh, it almost disappeared. And right now it's um, it's a completely different market. Uh, it's a market uh, mostly for grain when it comes to, to cultivation, farming. It's mostly the grain farmers that are doing relatively well. Obviously, it's not a uh, cash crop. Uh, it's, it's, it's a culture like any other. It's a crop like any other. And the European Union expects farmers to, to diversify their crop. Mm -hmm. So many farmers are using it just to uh, improve the soil condition or just to break the monoculture of, of grains, and etc. Okay. Um, I don't really know how many processing facilities are there in, in Poland when it comes to decortication, uh, because that's basically, I, I don't want to be uh, talking too much about the cannabinoid side and the grain side, because cannabinoid side, uh, well, obviously we can, but... Uh, it's, it's a completely different story to, to uh, have fiber processing. Sure, and sure. when it comes to uh, cannabinoids, there used to be a lot of um, places where you can send your material for extraction. I founded the first, well, there used to be a governmental one. Uh, they used to work with uh, hops and they used CO2 extraction for hops. Mm -hmm. some, some companies were using it for uh, hemp extraction. Um, we founded a, uh, our own lab to do it in around 2015. And then when I was uh, offering the services of, of extraction to other companies, well, they realized that they, they actually be doing it the same. So right now we have like a dozen of uh, CO2 extractors in Poland. And from my knowledge, most of them are losing money. 
mm. uh, because like the, the market is not as big as some of over optimistic um, reports were, were saying it's going to be. But okay. when it comes to fiber, uh, there is a national decortication line in Poznan, which is like a 90 year old institute for bad fibers, um, which is not actually operational. I mean, they are do doing some uh, research on it, but it, it's, it is state owned. Okay. That explains basically everything, right? Uh, when it comes to private companies, we have a completely different attitude than the US processors, uh, which is um, a lot of small companies doing small uh, scale processing. Is it a good thing? Not for me to tell. I mean, uh, time will tell who is actually going to be able to do it at, um, at a reasonable price and reasonable quality. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the, the market is somehow um, looking in a strange way because I always think about it as fiber market and herd sheaves are byproduct. And right now it's the opposite, the same as in the US. Uh, the herd market is actually bigger. It, it's right. ready. It's, it's there. People are craving for, for the material. And some, some operators are actually using decortication to produce sheaves and don't really care that much about the fiber, uh, which is a, a bad thing for the fiber market because it creates a lot of bad quality fiber on the market. So I'm constantly encountering people that tell me, no, I've been already trying to work with hemp fiber. It's not any good. I was like, okay, but where did you source it? You actually bought some, uh, some byproduct and you're saying that you have some experience. The good thing for me is about, about around it is I'm not constrained about the supply chain issues because I'm, I have my own supply chain. I don't need to sell the fiber to anyone and I don't want, need to buy the fiber from anyone. I have the exact kind of fiber that I need. If there's something wrong with it, I'm not going to my supplier. I'm going to the field and I'm changing it. The best thing about it is like if you may want to introduce some changes, you need to wait a year. Because if you want to change a variety, you want to change the uh, seeding ratio, you want to change something in the harvesting method, you only have one possibility a year. Uh, but since I've been doing it for 10 years now, then we already accumulated some um, knowledge that is um, substantial. Having that sort of long-term mind frame, mindset, I imagine is good for the growth of the industry. Sort of it keeps you... Uh, it's probably a slower it's, pace. It's good for the industry, but not necessarily good for um, here and now cash flow. Because like, I, I'm always uh, thinking, well, this is a good investment because it will, I will learn from from this, etc. But then at the end of the day, uh, you need to make money on it to be able to to be on the market next year. So it's always a constant struggle between what's good for the industry long term mm -hmm. and what's good for the cash flow short term so that you will still be in the market. One of the issues that a lot of hemp companies don't understand mm. on both sides of the Atlantic, that they they understand that in 10, 20 years, the market will be huge, uh, but they don't understand that they don't have the funding to last 10 or 20 years without uh, actually selling a product. Right, yeah. Um, so can you describe your your business from from field to finished product? Like what, what varieties are you growing? How, how much are you growing? So uh, just to, to, to make a clear distinction between the herbal and the, the fiber part. Sure. With, yep. the, with the herbal one, we grow like a few hectares, literally like two or three hectares is enough to supply the whole uh, production cycle. Uh, it is a, a variety in Italiana. It is an Italian variety that, uh, well, Italiana, an Italiana, it's, it's a variety sure. from Italy. Uh, it grows in Italy, we harvest it. Uh, some of it is harvested by hand, some of it is harvested mechanically. Uh, and then we make uh, the um, maceration process, which means like we blend the, the flowers with oil. With, in some cases, we decarboxylate the flower beforehand because mm -hmm. it depends if you want to make the CBD or CBDA product. Uh, and then after a specific time in a specific temperature, which we uh, established by trial and error, um, it is obviously um, verified at every stage. We have our own HPLC to, to check for the cannabinoid concentration, etc. Uh, and then it is pressed mechanically. So it's like a cold pressed CBD oil. 
uh, the British have this uh, this term called pressed to avoid novel food restriction, which is a complete utter bullshit yeah. in the European Union. Uh, and they still have it, even though they left the European Union. Mm. Uh, and that's also one of the uh, distinction that we have. And, and then we just battle it. And that's, that's the end product. Uh, we also put uh, flour itself into capsules so that it's a, a more cost effective okay. uh, way to, to supplement. Uh, and in both cases, we are selling it officially as dietary supplements, meaning it is meant for human consumption, right. not as many companies are doing in Europe. Well, let's just pretend it is a hairspray and you just uh, accidentally put it in your mouth or whatever, or, or you put explicitly do not consume on the product. Like three quarters of the market in Europe is not for consumption, wow. uh, which is mainly caused by the whole a misunderstanding about novel food, which is one thing that you Americans fortunately don't have to think about. Uh, novel food, just to, to give you a brief introduction, the European Commission in the 90s decided that there is a threat to human health and safety coming from uh, new kinds of food. And they mainly meant two things, nano food and artificial meat, which is something that we don't know how uh, interferes with our bodies, etc. And so they decided that if you want to introduce something completely new on the market uh, and sell it as a food product, you have to go through a um, procedure that is almost as strict as introducing a new pharmaceutical. Wow. It takes years. It takes millions of euros of proving that you're safe. Uh, but then came uh, European officials and they changed the understanding, no longer from really new foods, something that we have no um, story of in ingesting at all. And they said in 2016, they said hemp is novel. And I was like, well, if it is novel now, how come it was not novel in 1997? And why my grandmother was eating it and it was not novel back then, it's novel now. <clears throat> and there is a one uh, point in the, um, in the whole novel food story that most companies forget about. The, the, the law says itself that if you, as the business person, have any doubts about the history of consumption, you can apply for novel food. And they all apply for it. I don't have doubts. So I'm not actually obliged to do it. And then obviously it's like kind of wishful thinking about it. But uh, we actually went to court over it because we received a threat from our sanitary inspector. They were like, you cannot sell this product or you go for two years to prison, not because of THC, not because of this being hemp, but this because uh, allegedly breaching the novel food uh, regulations. So we went to the court actually wanting to lose it, because if you lose all the way, you can go to the European Court of Justice, which okay. is like to transform to the US is like a federal Supreme. level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but we've wo we actually won this case in the Supreme Court of Poland, and it says it is not novel, period. Because there's ample proof showing that hemp was actually in our diet. There is even a letter, imagine that, there's a letter from European Commission from 1997 confirming that, yes, we have history of consumption. And then they're changing their mind. The, 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 um, the very idea of changing history is a very... Um, thin line to walk around, right? Yeah, if if you're beginning to to change the history and, and claim that, well, we've been saying in 1997 that it is traditional food, but now we are changing our minds. So basically not to dwell too much on it, we are selling our herbal products as dietary supplements, as food, and we're doing it 100% legally. And we are not putting our cons consumers in a diff difficult position that, well, you can not ingest your product, but we know that you are, because th there's also a question of real health and safety uh, of the consumer. If we are selling our products as meant for consumption, we are bound by, by legal levels of contaminants. If you say that our product is not meant for consumption, you can have anything in it. Wow. And yeah. even if, if it, you will find heavy metals in it and uh, some uh, uh, solvents, well, you can always say, well, it was not meant for consumption. Is that cold pressed olive oil flour on the market here in the US? Uh, I'm not aware of it. It, it. it probably is because it's it, the, the technology is so simple and it's been for ages on, on the market, which doesn't necessarily mean that someone is doing it. Right. It's 
Um, Fair enough. I don't know the, the, the situation in, in the US. Uh, I know there's a couple of companies doing it in the UK. Okay. Um, and it's it, it, has, it has so many advantages and almost no disadvantages. I mean, the first thing is you're making the, the most natural product possible. You just put all the ratios of cannabinoids, flavonoids, etc. that are in the plant and you just ingest them as they are. Uh, the other thing is um, it's affordable. It, it's, the technology is very simple, very uh, cost effective. So you're not making any, you don't need uh, very sophisticated, sophisticated equipment or knowledge to actually do it. It's, it's the same way that people make olive oil with uh, pepperoncini sure. or with yeah, uh, right. garlic. You just, instead of garlic, use hemp. It's like you infuse it in the oil. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that idea. Normally, we, we talk more about fiber and grain, but I'm fascinated by that aspect of what you're doing. But now let's shift over to your, your fiber uh, production line. Yeah, yeah. so just, just a brief uh, remark about, uh, regarding uh, grain. It yeah. is a market in Poland, but I'm not uh, in it, so I, I just don't feel uh, really um, knowledgeable enough to, to sure. speak about it. Uh, when it comes to fiber, uh, we basically grow it, as I mentioned, decorticate, harvest, all the steps ourselves. Uh, probably at some point we will outsource the farming part to our local partners. There's a lot of local farmers asking about it because it's it's good for their uh, soil. It's it's actually one of the way to diversify the, uh, their economic uh, um, uh, activity as well. Because basically growing regular staples in Europe is trying not to lose money. It's you you cannot possibly make money out of it. The best case scenario is you don't lose money and you leave off the subsidies, uh, which is one of the reasons why European farmers are, are, um, are yeah. striking at the moment. I don't know, does the word striking? No. Um, Strike. What's this? Yeah. Uh, like sorry, a, what, what's the English word for like uh, protest. Class action when you just protesting? Yeah. 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 So, there's a, there's a uh, joke here that says, you know, how, how do you make a small fortune in farming? You start with a you large with fortune. A large fortune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's basically the same thing here. Um, so uh, how do we actually proceed? We grow hemp on um, on organic soil. Uh, and by organic, I don't only mean the fact that we're not using any pesticides, etc. It's just in the place we are in, which is northeastern Poland, right next to Kaliningrad, which is Russia already. So it's like the end of the European Union. Uh, we have very high uh, carbon content in the soil, so it actually uh, gives very good yields even without fertilization, although we obviously try to add. If, if you remove some nitrogen, you, you are supposed to put it back or actually put it beforehand. Uh, so we grow it. We put the seeds in the soil around uh, late April, early May. Uh, we use a very dense uh, sowing rate uh, as for grain. It's like 25 kilos of uh, grain, small grains, because that's I, I recently had this discussion on LinkedIn with people from US saying, well, kilos per hectare is not necessarily, or pounds per, per acre, not, not necessarily a good uh, way of measuring because at the end of the day, what matters is the quantity of, of plants measure. per meter uh, and uh, when you use Asian varieties, which is like almost like baseball balls, the, the seeds, uh, compared to the French varieties that we are using, I grow only French varieties in Poland. Uh, I, I will go on that in a, se in a second. Uh, 25 kg per hectare means approximately 1, 1. 1.5 millions of plants per hectare. So it's 100 to 150 plants per square meter. Okay. Uh, we use it in 20... 20 sorry 12 centimeter rows so it's like five inches rows uh, so a very dense setup uh, which allows us not to use any herbicides not to use any foil to cover the ground not to do absolutely anything right, except for just going there and, and having fun on, the, on uh, looking at the plants and making videos and, and pictures because <laughs> you honestly don't need to do absolutely anything about it which is also one of the reasons why farmers are asking about it, because uh, it, it, it it's often happens that the farmers are uh, having too much ground and too little time. Uh, so it is a good choice for them. You, you just don't need to go into the field and do some spraying and etc. Et uh, and while on the northern hemisphere, most farmers 
go around September or August around to, to, to the harvesting stage, we don't do anything. We just leave the plants as they are uh, for uh, what we call winter redding, some people call standing redding. Uh, so we basically leave the plants as they are, they mature, they die, they uh, all the grain, all the flower is falling down to the ground. So all the nutrients that were up uh, taken uh, to it, they actually go back to the ground, uh, which compared to a traditional method where you cut it in August and you bale it together with the, the flowers and the green parts, uh, and you move it to a decorticating facility and you actually treat it, uh, uh, after all, as a dust. It, it's, it's a waste. Instead of uh, taking it out of the field, we leave it in the field. Uh, around now, which is like the beginning of March, as we speak, uh, we are preparing for harvest. So uh, it's almost like in Australia, but we are still in, in, in Poland. <laughs> uh, 10 months after actually putting the, the seeds into the ground, without doing anything uh, throughout the period, the stalks are already well retted. The stalks are dry because the winter basically killed them. Uh, we have a very good climatic conditions for that. Uh, I know I've been talking about winter retting with some people from Kentucky, from uh, southern states. Uh, it's not necessarily applicable there. I know they do a lot, a bit of it in Montana. Uh, I, I think some uh, trials are made in New England, like Pennsylvania or. Vermont. Like, yeah, 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 so some place around there. Around there. Oh, because and Pennsylvania too, is... Steve Groff, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, because you have some kind of winter that actually resembles winter. Sometimes. Uh, in order, <laughs> well, it, it's actually crucial for it to happen every year. Mm -hmm. Like one of the reasons we cannot grow tropical um, plants, tropical trees, is like it's enough for one day of, of freezing uh, temperature to kill them. And and here is the opposite. You need at least one day of, of, of uh, freezing. What, what happens with water when it reaches freezing point? It swells. Uh, and uh, if that water is inside the plant, it is actually doing the decortication for you. It breaks the cell uh, wall. OK, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. And all the, uh, like when you take a fresh, uh, like imagine it's late summer, you take a fresh hemp stalk and you remove the past. It, it goes off very easily, right? But what you are left uh, on your hands with is like a kind of sticky glue or well, however you can call it. Then if you leave this plant to, to die off or cut it and leave it to dry, the glue becomes actually glue. And then you cannot separate the two things easily. If you go through the decorticator, you use a lot of energy and you will never achieve 100% um, separation. Uh, what I've seen uh, at processing facilities in the US, which were all working with um, material that was harvested in autumn, mm -hmm. it was a nightmarish level of um, fighting against the stalk to actually make it separate from like hurts from, from the bust. In our case, what you need is basically just sieve one from the another. It, it separates automatically. You don't need to add any kind of energy. Obviously, if you're working with uh, tons of material rather than uh, handfuls, you mm. will need some equipment, you need some machinery, and you need a lot of patience and, uh, and perseverance to actually make it happen. But you use much less energy. And the glues that, w that in uh, regular facilities are being transformed into dust, they contain a lot of nitrogen. So we are leaving that nitrogen in the field. So it's the closest you have to a closed cycle of of nutrients. Obviously, you take some nitrogen, uh, nitrogen especially uh, with you from the field, but it's around 100 kilos per, per hectare only. Um, so yeah, then we bring it to our decortication facility. Okay, I have a quick question. Uh, which is, yeah. Um, does the winter redding uh, degrade the quality of the herd at all, or are you still able to capture um, market quality herd? Mm. It does influence it. I wouldn't say it's uh, it makes it impossible to use uh, for for any applications, which are the two main areas of application. The same in the US, which is animal bedding and mm. construction. Okay. Uh, for construction, we had zero complaints. For animal bedding, we had one customer that has very expensive horses, mm. and he was like, "Okay, I'm not 
taking the risk that there will be some kind of microbiology on it because retting is basically a microbial uh, issue, right? You you, you employ um, fun fungi to to actually do the work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't kill it off afterwards. It's still there. It's not um, harmful to to employees or or whatever, but uh, it it might mean that there are some grayish spots on the on the, the herd it's not white as the um, herd i've seen from kansas it's like <laughs> almost white right because there is sun all the time and it just uh, yeah. sterilizes it almost uh, but but it, it doesn't mean that we are not uh, basically making money out of herd obviously the herd will always be by volume the largest yield you're taking out of the field whatever we grow for you always end up with the most of their product being hurt. Okay. Uh, but your focus cheese. then is the, the bass fibers for textiles. Uh, yeah, we had this idea uh, of doing everything, but as uh, everyone at some point reaches the conclusion that if you want to be doing everything, you, you won't be doing all of it uh, in a good way. So with, with uh, Hertz, we tried to do some um, construction ourselves. We tried to employ it in furniture industry, but at the end of the day, we just decided to sell it as it is to other companies, let them grow uh, their industry starting from this level so that, they, so that they don't have to be doing all the vertical integration because most companies don't want to be operating as a vertically integrated company. They want to buy their inputs, do one specific process, and then sell the outcome. Um, but yeah, our focus is, uh, is bus fiber. Uh, and uh, what I'm seeing both in the US and in Europe, that is not enough. Just having reaching the stage of decorticated fiber, uh, you end up with the product that basically as a consumer, neither you nor me, we don't need bus fiber. What's the end use of the bus fiber? We had some customers using it in Germany as a roof insulation. Okay. Uh, so basically, you take the the without any further processing, you just put it uh, in the, on on the roof to to isolate from uh, from heat uh, from uh, winter temperatures and and also acoustic isolation. But it's not a high value uh, product. What I learned from my previous company, where we are focused on CO two extraction of of, uh, of uh, hemp flowers, is like the closer you are to the end consumer, the higher margin you retain for yourself, like ABC of business, right? But uh, but it was the first business for me, so I had to learn it the hard way. Uh, and, and that's what we also aim for with our textile product. Selling raw fiber is not a good business idea. I strongly believe that it is not a good uh, way to, at the end of the day, to make money. And uh, I'm not, it's not my main aim of running the company, but if I won't be making money, I won't have the company to have fun in. I'm doing it because I like it, but but I cannot be spending my own money on it sure. uh, forever. I'm doing it right now, but um, it has to stop at some point. <laughs> uh, so so then what we are doing is uh, refining the fiber, which is basically cottonizing it. Mm -hmm. And cottonization is a process that uh, everyone knows about it and everyone understands it differently. Uh, so when people are talking about it, they, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There are some people in the US uh, claiming to um, invent cottonization. Well, they will have to be very, very, very old because I've seen books from the 18th century uh, which already use the term cottonization. So um, not possible to invent it now again. <laughs> um, and there's broadly speaking, three different methods of doing it. It's either chemically or mechanically or biologically. Uh, we are focused on the mechanical process. Uh, so sure, you can do it with um, some harsh chemicals to remove everything else rather than cellulose and leave pure cellulose and then work with that. Um, that's basically the Chinese way. They don't care much about the environment and their waters and their employees' lungs, etc. Uh, so it is the easiest way. Uh, not necessarily the cheapest, but if you don't have any environmental concerns, it might actually be the cheapest way. Uh, the question is, if you remove absolutely everything from the fiber and you just leave cellulose in it, is it hemp fiber still? Or is it already cellulose, right? It's, it's, a, um, it's a difficult uh, discussion. Then 
you have um, biological means, which means employing enzymes. Uh, the French, the Belgians are pretty strong in, in this area. I don't have the patience for it. Uh, it requires very strict conditions and uh, it just, it's not a natural fit with me. Uh, what we're left with and what, what I'm most comfortable with is mechanical processing. So we basically uh, in, employ a lot of brushes, a lot of uh, carding wire to open mechanically the fiber. Because okay. when people mean, when people say hemp fiber, they mean bust. They mean those long strands of, of uh, fibers. Hemp fiber themselves are very short. They're like one and a half inches long. The reason why we are thinking in uh, long term, in, in terms of long uh, fiber, is because they are connected by those natural glues into strands. What we are doing is we are separating the uh, the decorticated bast into individual fibers that would as closely as possible resemble cotton. That hence cottonization. Uh, why we're doing it? Because once you've done it, you can employ um, cotton equipment for further processing. So it's basically a carding uh, machine and all the all the following steps. So uh, that allows us to actually spin it into yarn in our facility. Right. So that's what changed. When, when I was at NOCO last year, I only had fiber to show of our uh, produce. Like what That's where doing. you and I met last year at NOCO, right? Yeah, yeah, we met last year and I was showing the fiber and saying, well, I will be spinning yarn out of it. And I've seen this degree of disbelief in a lot of people I was speaking with. I'm like, okay, we've met like by the dozen people that are claiming that they will be actually spinning out of it. Well, we actually are. We are actually doing it, right? So uh, we had this... Uh, so... This equipment installed. You're, you're so, holding up some spools, so describe what you're holding up so folks yeah, can yeah, so see this it is, in their um, minds. Uh, 100% European-made uh, hemp plus cotton yarn, uh, which we make in-house at our facility from our own grown hemp. Uh, what I've been seeing in the, in the hemp uh, textile market is the easiest way to manufacture a um, hemp t-shirt or whatever is to order a cotton one from China and ask them to put hemp on the label. But like more than half of the market is operating this way. Unfortunately. Are you, but, you're saying so uh, many of the, the clothing, the t-shirts that we see that say hemp or don't have any hemp in them? I already received some threats about me saying that. So, <laughs> so no, that's I, I not gonna, what you're saying. I'm just going to tell you that you never have 100% uh, guarantee unless you actually do it yourself. And that's, that was my, my um, idea behind it. I wanted to do it for myself. Uh, and the only way to be sure is actually if you grow it. I, I have 100% um, guarantee that I'm working with hemp because I grow it. Uh, I'm not buying the fibers for some pla from, from some place or the yarn. So what I've been showing here is like the, the spool of yarn that we're actually manufacturing from uh, uh, Polish hemp and Greek cotton. We are uh, focused on making the produce 100% European, both in terms of materials, raw materials, etc. Because there's also a lot of uh, confusion about the um, EU made. EU made might mean that you're actually importing half of the shoe from Bangladesh and the other part of the shoe from China, then you glue them together in Italy and those are Italian shoes. Well, uh, and it, it, it happens all, all the time and in every industry, but we want to be conveying this message to our customer that if you're actually buying here, you're supporting not only the, the uh, manufacture of the end product, you're actually uh, uh, supply, uh, mm, uh, what's the word? The word that comes to my mind is integrity. It's like integrity is part of your brand at that point. Uh, yeah, because there, there, there's enough customers that are actually willing to um, support manufacturers that are based in here. They just lack knowledge. So what we are uh, trying to convey the message is like, look at us. We, that's why, one of the reasons why I'm showing so much on LinkedIn. Right. Transparency. I just want people to be transparency, precisely. Like, there, there's a lot of talk about the uh, supply chain uh, transparency, which is based on some kind of blockchain issues that at the end of the day, when I've been asking my uh, cotton supplier, can he supply with organic cotton? It's like, yeah, I can make it organic, but it doesn't actually mean anything. And 
almost everyone in the cotton industry agree with the fact that most organic cotton is basically exactly the same cotton with different um, documentation. So the only way of actually being 100% certain that um, cotton is grown according to the highest environmental standards is that it's actually taking place in Europe because you cannot grow in Europe genetically modified organisms. You cannot use certain pesticides, certain uh, chemicals that are often used on, on cotton. Although we are also working with a hemp plus lyocell um, blend. So we are... The, the most important message is we are actually doing it instead of talking about it because we are all tired in the industry of um, great presentations and uh, pitch decks and people saying that they're going to save the world with hemp. I'm not trying to save the world. I'm trying to make decent products in my country so that uh, European customers can uh, support their local economy instead of sending money to faraway countries that don't care about the environment and they don't care about the labor conditions. So this is a good time to maybe talk a little bit more about other things that the American hemp industry could learn from what's happening in Europe. Well, one thing that I wouldn't call it uh, what's happening in Europe, because what we are doing is slightly different than the the conventional uh, knowledge in Europe. Okay. So I wouldn't consider us as a benchmark of the European hemp industry. My company is, or operates a bit differently. Vertical integration is not necessarily a European idea. It's actually, it was an American idea. Mr. Ford introduced it, right? And yeah. he actually made every step of the way for his car and then somehow we disappeared. Uh, anyways, uh, there is an idea in Europe that if you want to be growing hemp for textile, it has to be long fiber. And by long fiber, it, the long fiber is not necessarily long. The definition of long fiber is that you keep the stalks parallel to each other through the whole processing uh, line. Uh, that's a French idea, French and Belgian uh, way of, of utilizing their flax industry. They have a lot of flax linen industry and they just want to be using their machinery. Sure. Uh, so um, I see some confusion that some people believe that short fiber is for technical application only and long fiber is for um, textiles. 99% of the fiber of the textiles that we are wearing is from short fibers. Cotton is a short fiber, polyester is a short fiber, wool is a short fiber. And these three constitute like 97% of the textile industry. So why do we insist on making hemp so special? That's one of the reasons why we are a niche market, because everyone wants to be so special. We are not. We, the moment we realize that we are just yet another crop, just yet another industry, the better for the industry. And, and then, but, but there's one distinction I would like to make between the, like one error that I believe the American industry is doing. I've already heard a lot of talk of growing the fiber in the US and sending the fiber to China to spin, to make clothes of it, and then import it back again. Why? What's the point? I mean, I know that that's what you're doing with cotton, but the reason that you're growing cotton in the US only to send it to China is historical mistakes or historical, like, coincidences rather than a, a plan for it. It's, it yeah, it's I think you're talking to, about to Patagonia, through. the company Patagonia. And I, my opinion on that is that they're doing it f for marketing reasons at this point to sort of maybe bring some, some light and focus to the hemp industry. But yeah, the whole idea of growing it here, shipping it there, sending it back, it's it just it goes against the whole sort of it's, carbon footprint story that hemp yeah, tells. It's exactly. like, yeah, it's and maddening. It's like, I understand that early '90s and uh, the the era of, of uh, Clinton administration, it was like send all outsource everything possible. But then we are no longer in the '90s, and people start to realize that actually you need to have some manufacturing closer to we home. Need to bring it it here. might be Mexico in your case, yeah. So. I, I would obviously love to see my products in the US, but my main focus in the European is the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the good thing about strong regulations is Europe often goes as the um, as the first in the world to introduce some sort of regulations. 
and they already talk a lot about uh, the circularity, about um, actually not being able to import some bad uh, practices in, in, in a ready-made product. There is a talk that I would love to see it happen. Like if you're selling a washing machine in Europe, it has to last three years. You are not allowed to sell a washing machine that will break down after a year. It's just forbidden by law. And they want to introduce the same thing for clothes. There is a talk about a quality a minimum level that will allow your clothes to be washed 30 times before they disintegrate. It's not the case with more than half of the products in the market. Like most of them are made to last for a couple of washes right. and then you just discard it planned and by discarding it uh, yeah and then what happens to that product goes it goes to either to landfill or it goes to africa and then just uh, pollutes because one thing that most consumers don't realize it if you buy a hundred percent cotton uh, shirt it's absolutely not a hundred percent cotton shirt there's a lot of chemicals in it which you, by law you are not obliged to tell about it so for instance, like the, the harmless example, or might be harmful, but dyes. If you, cotton is a natural color is like a creamy or whitish, something like that. Sure. If you buy a black cotton shirt, by definition, it cannot be 100% cotton because it contains some dye. And then you put it to the landfill. The dye somehow goes with the fluids into the, the water. And obviously, I'm oversimplifying for the sake of, of the brevity of, of the argument. But yep, yep. there's a lot of environmental concerns with uh, cheap imports from uh, China. Uh, we have the same discussion in Europe as you have in the US with Shane or Temu, the, the companies that are using the loopholes in the, in the uh, tax codes, custom duties, etc. Uh, I believe that in 10, 20 years, there will be a substantial industry, textile industry, homegrown, uh, which goes somehow against um, what's actually happening right now. Mm. There's a lot of companies closing down. We only had the, the brand bankruptcy filing of Renewsol. Uh, in, in Europe, You, I know you have a lot of companies bankrupting in, in the US. And what differs in Europe from the US when it comes to textile market, we don't have cotton. We have tiny amounts of cotton in Greece and in uh, in Spain, but basically, since the whole European continent is somehow between Montana and Canada, uh, maybe some some right. midwestern states, we cannot grow not the best cotton conditions. for environment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we'll have to import it. So the only way to actually have a uh, homegrown industry is to base it on, on hemp, at least in some uh, percentage. To, we have perfect condition to grow hemp. We have uh, uh, the mentality that allows it. People are not afraid of it. People are aware of the uh, the history around it. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking of all the European countries. Uh, we have enough uh, environmentally conscious people. Probably when it comes to environmental consciousness, we are in the uh, like the top of the world. There's uh, the level of understanding, obviously not among all the people. Sure. There will always be like a, only a, a tiny percentage will tiny, depends. Um, but that's enough for, to sustain companies like ours. We have 500 million people living in the European Union. Five to 10% of them is more than enough to sustain uh, sustainable companies and, and show the way that it is possible because the easiest, um, um way for for consumers to buy chinese goods is like well we have no alternative it's like people are aware that it is harmful that they shouldn't be doing it. like okay but what choice do i have should i be going naked no i need to buy the chinese goods. And, uh, <laughs> yeah uh, so we want to be we want to show people that they have the alternative yeah. and that it is actually based on the fully natural fully biodegradable products and it's made here with uh, ethical uh, way of thinking. And yes, it will be a bit more expensive. But on the end of the day, you're actually paying for your um, health, for the place you live, for your children, etc. So, well, let's let's talk. Let's get back to talking about hemp in Poland. I saw you made a post on LinkedIn about feral hemp or wild hemp. Can you talk about how that shows up in the environment there and where that came from? Well. 
uh, wild hemp uh, might come for two, two different reasons. One is farmers growing regular uh, modern varieties and just switching from one place to another, and then hemp is leaving there. It sits in there, right? Hemp has this um, property that when it matures, it doesn't mature evenly. So if you choose the right spot for harvesting grain, you will always have some percentage of it already uh, maturing like a week ago and already falling down. There is a lot of it being um, eaten by the birds and, and left someplace else. Uh, so we do see a, a bit of uh, wild hemp growing on the fields that were used for, um, for hemp in the previous season, but I don't really see, uh, see it as much of an issue because unfortunately, most of the Polish farmer use glyphosate on a regular basis. Right. So um, they basically kill it off and uh, it's no longer the, the case. In, in, in our field, we grow hemp after hemp. Uh, I'm a strong believer in what is not being considered uh, natural, but monoculture is the most natural thing ever. If we disappear from the face of the earth, there will be no crop rotation. There will be only monocultures. But monoculture, meaning growing the same crop every year on the same field, does not mean you have to exterminate every other plant in the vicinity. You can still have biodiversity while growing monoculture or any other crop in monoculture. Uh, but there's also a, an interesting um, uh, thing about wild hemp in Poland is we have places where it is growing for centuries, for decades, just as it is, because without any human interference. And there is a lot of uh, proofs for that in the names of the villages. Like Konopie, which is the word for hemp, is a stem for dozens and hundreds of small towns. Like Konopiska, Konopno, Konopat. There's all villages that basically mean we were growing hemp here centuries ago. And when you go around September and... Um, like some people go mushroom hunting, I go uh, cannabis hunting in in, um, in the forest. Uh, well, some people also go animal hunting, but that's sure. not my pair of shoes. Uh, so uh, you can always find, well, always. I have this um, talent of actually finding those strains and you can see evidently that it is not some uh, plant that was growing like outdoor grower uh, doing some illegal guerrilla marijuana farming because you can see it with your own eyes that is a different plant and you can also we always collect the the seeds and the flowers for analysis they often exceed the legal limit because the legal limit was not uh, there 100 years ago right. when my grandmother was growing hemp it i was asking her about varieties and i was like what varieties it was just hemp there was no marijuana hemp and uh, fiber hemp it was just hemp and it, they usually contain around 1% THC and 2-3% CBD. There's a lot of CBDV, uh, THCV, like a very interesting uh, blend of cannabinoids. Um, the grain is almost non-existing. It's like tiny, mm. uh, almost black, a very hard shell, very hard to uh, germinate. So it, it's evidently a different strain of basically cannabis ruderalis. Uh, and it, it is, this is something that used to grow here a lot. Um, and I also consider it as a kind of proof that hemp is nothing new in our area. Because uh, when I started uh, my uh, business uh, dealings with, with hemp, a lot of people were, were considering it that I'm trying to introduce some new plant to our uh, climate zone. It was here forever. So... Uh, and this is just one of many proofs of that. Well, let's talk about how you got into hemp in the first place. What's your sort of creation myth or origin story? Well, uh, as with quite a few of us in the industry, it started when I got arrested for possession. Uh, because uh, in Poland... Uh, I did not see that coming. Even now, even today, possession of the tiniest amount is a crime uh, punishable with up to three years in prison. So we have two to three million people smoking marijuana regularly, and yet all of them should go to prison for three years. Uh, and they actually introduced this law in 2001. 
Uh, I was 16 years old back then. I was not using marijuana back then. Uh, and, and it got me thinking like, okay, it's less harmful than alcohol. Uh, it is actually, okay, it's, it is a drug. Like I, I have no issues with the word the drug. Yeah, we are all taking drugs. We drink coffee, we smoke cigarettes. These are all drugs. Uh, and relatively a uh, not very harmful one. So why put people into prison for it? So I got engaged in some kind of marijuana policy regime change. Uh, first, without any business ideas about it. It was just like a volunteer. Um, and um, then I ran for the uh, national parliament and the European parliament with a single uh, idea, just legalize marijuana, tax it, and just spend the money on some good things. So most uh, politicians or wannabe politicians, they go and, and they say, I'm gonna give you this, I'm gonna give you that. I was telling, I'm actually gonna take money away from you. Uh, just legalize and tax marijuana. And it Did actually you... put me in a, uh, no, I, fortunately I didn't want you any- didn't... Uh, You didn't get elected, got... all right. No, 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 but it, it did put uh, the issue maybe not obviously at the center stage of, of the election, but it became a topic of discussion. And uh, I've been also telling not only about tax revenue, but also about job creation. And I heard a lot of time, well, that's bullshit. Yeah. There is no job creation in, in cannabis in hand. And, and the uh, always stupid argument of if it would be the case, someone would have already been doing it. So I was like, well, I'm going to show you. Uh, not maybe the um, the best founding myth for a company, but it was like, I just wanted to show people that it's actually possible. Uh, I was also working as a journalist back then, and I wanted to make the uh, the article about uh, some of Catch-22 situation in Polish law, because in order to grow hemp, you need to be registered in a registry of hemp growers, but the registry was not existing. So... Uh, how can you say that I'm in the registry if there is no registry, but you cannot grow if you're not in the registry? So I wanted to write an article about it. And I applied for the registry, knowing that I will be rejected because there is no registry. And unfortunately for the uh, article, I actually got the license. Uh, <laughs> some uh, wise person from the ministry said, well, the country cannot expect uh, from a citizen to fulfill something that is not possible. So they actually gave me the license. That was 2014. It was the first private license issued for hemp cultivation in Poland. And I was like, okay, what now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wanted to show that it's not possible, but I actually proved that it is possible. So maybe I should start doing it. That was year 2014. Uh, I found uh, several dozen uh, people wanting to grow hemp for me. Uh, without any particular idea what we're going to do with this material. So uh, it, it is we've done exactly what I'm now ad ad advising people against. It's like, if you want to grow, know precisely why you're growing it for, who's going to buy this material from you, how you're going to harvest it. We had zero of that. We, we did like, well, Wild West, let's grow it, and then we're going to see. Uh, fortunately for us, that was also the time that Sanjay Gupta made the material for CNN about Charlotte Figgy and, and the whole CBD craze began. Uh, and um, long story short, we started uh, manufacturing CBD uh, products because as it happens, my wife is a PhD in chemistry and she was working with CO2 extraction beforehand, uh, which is like, that was the limiting factor for a lot of people that they had zero knowledge about CO2 extraction. I had it in-house in, in, in the family. So we, we started a very small company. Uh, we employed like a dozen of people. It quickly grew in two or three years. It grew to 100 employees and uh, approximately like 6 million revenue uh, dollars per year. Uh, and in 2018, at the height of the um, craze for CBD, um, the Canadian holding, uh, the stock exchange company was looking for some uh, company to acquire in Europe. I was not willing to sell, and it's probably one of the reasons why I sold it, because they were looking at different companies, and I was like, no, I'm not interested. So they knew, okay, he's actually having something worth having if yeah. he's not. Right. And there's always the argument of enough money that will change your mind. So uh, they put an offer, 
me being like 28 or no, I was 28 when I founded the company, but early 30s yeah. uh, without with actually spending all my money on the company. So the company was doing re- pretty good. Me, myself, not necessarily yeah. so. Uh, so um, we decided to, to sell it. The idea was that I will continue to run the company. Uh, apparently, their idea was different. <laughs> uh, so after, after a few weeks, I was uh, left without, uh, without the company. And actually, with a non-compete clause that said, you're not allowed to do CBDs. So imagine 2018, I've got quite a lot of uh, money to invest. I got quite a lot of uh, willpower and uh, knowledge, but I cannot be working with CBDs. So that's how I got into Fiverr. That was the moment that was like, okay, I want to be working with hemp. I have the means, I have the knowledge, I have the energy, but I don't have the uh, the capacity to work with with CBD. Uh, so that's how we went into uh, into yarn. So the yarn that we're producing right now, the woven fabrics that we're producing right now, are made thanks to a non-complete clause that was meant to destroy me, and it actually made me stronger. So. I love that. That's the best hemp origin story I have ever heard. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Oh. Maciej Kowalski, it is great to talk to you. Um, I Thank you for sharing all of this today. I've learned so much about Poland and about your company. And I wish I could talk to you for a lot longer. I... Yeah, we'll, we'll have this opportunity in a month time on, on NOCO. So if, if any be there, of the yeah. listeners will be willing, yeah, yeah, we'll be there. I'm also traveling with my colleagues, so there will be more opportunity to, to speak. We'll be showing our yarns, our woven fabrics, our knitted fabrics. Uh, and, and hopefully, I'm, I'm really hope to establish some presence with these products in the US. As uh, right now, what you're doing in the US, you have a lot of decortication, a lot of raw material, and a lot of imports from China. What you don't have is actually a sustainably made products from the hemp fiber. So, uh, if any, anyone will be interested, I'm uh, more than happy to, to share. And uh, you're all invited to NOCO. I, I don't know if the episode will be aired before uh, NOCO. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. This episode, uh, it's actually airing right now. No, not right now, but I'll edit <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, all right, sure. So, uh, no, uh, it'll, this yes. is going to go this this week. This will be this Wednesday's yeah, uh, show. Right. So, yep. So, it's, so it's yeah. Be, um, so, yeah, if anyone wants to catch up on, on NoCo, I will be there. You'll be there. And what's the best way for people to reach you? Is it through LinkedIn or LinkedIn. A, a website? LinkedIn, definitely. Uh, LinkedIn is where I'm uh, almost every day. I try to post daily whenever I have the chance. If I'm not traveling, and even when I'm traveling, I'm, I'm available there. And uh, so, yeah, just find me on LinkedIn. Kowalski is the most popular name in Poland. So that <laughs> might, may, so there's probably like dozens of us, Maciej Kowalski. Uh, but if you have anyone from the uh, LinkedIn uh, hemp industry, you will definitely see me as a mutual friend. So okay. you're all welcome there. I will put a link to your LinkedIn page on the show page for this episode. Yep. People can find you there. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been invited to the European Hemp Expo in Prague in June. Will you yeah. be there? Yes, we, I will also be speaking there in some panel about uh, the hemp industry. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see you there in June, I think, right? Yep, yeah, it's in early June. Yep. Great. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing you again in person out in Colorado. So I, uh, I yeah. wish you safe travels and thanks again for all of this. It's great to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to share our story. All right, there you go. Marce Kowalski. So what did you think of that? I would love to hear your thoughts on today's show or your thoughts on anything, really. Do you have thoughts about the hemp industry? Share them with me. Send an email to podcast at LancasterFarming.com. I love to get emails from listeners. I love to know who's out there because we're all in this together, right? So anyway, my name is Eric Herlock. I am the senior digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Check us out online. You can read all the stories about agriculture right there. Sign up for our newsletters. Get a subscription to our print edition. You can do all of the things at LancasterFarming.com. Not to mention our social media output. I don't know if you've uh, signed up to follow any of our channels, but... My colleague Stephanie Spiker is doing a great job uh, on the socials. So anyway, um, that's enough from me. Until next time, I will see you in the newspaper.
industrial hemp. Podcast o konopiach przemysłowych Lancaster Farming Industrial jest chroniony prawem autorskim 2024 przez Gazetę Rolniczą Lancaster. Dzisiejszy program został napisany, nagrany, zmontowany i wyprodukowany przez Elica Hurlocka. Muzykę, którą słychać przez cały występ, zapewnia blaszane cię ptaka.